Movement Parenting Collective Families. I'm Erica Desper, the founder of The Collective, and I am joined again today by Justin Menda. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me. He and his wife Pleasure. own the tutoring company, Rocket Prep, and we are here today to talk about the value of test preparation and when parents should start thinking about it. Uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say, Justin. You and I were chatting before we hit record, and I was sharing a little bit about my own personal feelings about standardized tests. Um, my son is 13. We're dealing with a school struggle, which is what started this whole journey. Um, I have pretty much opted him out of standardized testing at every opportunity because of the anxiety that it creates. Um, so I'm yeah, I'm anxious to hear what you say. And then the the conflict that I run into is if he does decide to take, let's say, the SATs and go to college, et cetera, have I, have I done him a disservice because now he's not used to sitting for standardized tests? So I have a lot of mixed feelings about this, but not a lot of experience with them. Um, so first things first, I think parents want to know, um, like, what if I said to you, well, I opt him out because I feel like standardized test scores are meaningless. Mm. What would you say to that? I hear that a lot, yeah. <laughs> not just from me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it, it's sort of, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, supported these days by the, um, the, um, the test optional, mm. uh, movement basically, which, um, you know, there are a lot of things that are optional in your college admissions, uh, you know, profile, like right. extracurriculars and rigorous classes. And, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> no one's going to say that those are meaningless. Uh, so, you know, what really is the standard, the the, uh, the status of standardized testing? And, and the point is, uh, you know, it's ambiguous. Um, and there's a strong argument that uh, the college is like it that way. But maybe we'll get to that in a second. Um, but but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it is interesting that that we think of this, uh, you know, in such black and white terms, right? Like our standardized tests sort of like a sine qua non of education. Like, you know, is it really the case that you can't assess student achievement without them? Or uh, are they completely pointless? Is this some pointless hoop that, you know, uh, everybody has to jump through? And And actually, I started out in the latter camp when I got my first test prep tutoring job, interestingly enough, like my, my position was, um, you know, if this is a pointless hoop that people have to jump through, you know, maybe we can at least do it in a way that cultivates some transferable skills, you know, mm. um, that was my take on it. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, you know, work for a company that, uh, you know, at the time sort of valued that approach. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the thing to remember is that you know, the reality is rarely on the extremes. Uh, standardized tests absolutely do not define a person. <laughs> they are not a sine qua non of education. There are tons of ways, uh, arguably better ways, to uh, assess student performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, lots of ways to demonstrate competence in, uh, in various subject areas or, you know, college readiness and so on. Um, nor are they meaningless. Okay. Turns out they are actually unpopular opinion. <laughs> very, very <laughs> good. For all opinions, especially if you're based <laughs> on in fact. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's the point, right? Th they're actually, I, I mean, the, the, the big ones, I should say the big ones, like the SAT and the ACT, for example, are actually very, very good at measuring certain skills that constitute a small and very well-defined slice of a person's capabilities. That's a really good explanation. You know, so, um, and, you know, the, the, you know, I, I, I could just give some small examples of how this plays out. Um, the, uh, I mean, a lot of people experience the questions as tricky, mm -hmm. right? And, and interestingly enough, this is, this is one, one area on which, um, like sort of cynical test prep pundits and um, uh, staunch anti-test people tend to agree, which is that the, you know, the questions are sort of tricky on purpose. Okay. Uh, what's actually the case, like I, I, two, two aspects of questions on a well-designed test that I think people experience as tricky uh, are, first of all, the, the answer choices are made up of answers you might get 
if you made common mistakes. You know, so if I ask you, you know, uh, uh, a math question, you know, what's three times 15? And the answer choices are pandas, airplanes, you know, <laughs> a, a number <laughs> and lotion. <laughs> There's no point, right? Like right. you're not, you're not measuring not math measuring at that point, right? Um, so they have to know that there has to be some way to discriminate, you know, between somebody who's getting the right answer by coincidence versus, you know, are they re really actually demonstrating some level of competence? Um, and, you know, how do you do that without legions and legions of experts, all of whom you can trust to evaluate <laughs> hundreds of written responses? Well, you do it with multiple choice, right? you know, uh, and, and, and you, you, you know, again, you, you um, add in incorrect answers that, are tempting. They're not tempting because they're trying to trick you. They're tempting because, right. you know, people tend to misperceive things in certain ways and, and they, they want to know, are you, you know, are you able to uh, think clearly in these situations? Right. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. And, and another thing I, I've noticed um, is that particularly on the math section, math sections of, of these tests, um, they want to know to some extent, do you really understand the math? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we were talking in a in a previous video about the way most kids experience math classes these days. Uh, they experience it as a series of algorithms and just arcane procedures mm -hmm. for getting predetermined answers to questions they didn't care to ask. <laughs> it's 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 not it's not learning math as a language. It's not being able to think flexibly about it. It's memorize this procedure who cares what it means just trust me you'll use it someday yeah and right? today there's just so many more steps to to those you know sure yeah it's like it's it's process. proliferating <laughs> yeah o oddly in an attempt to make it you know more relevant and intuitive yeah but that, that's that's, that's like for a whole, another day that's a whole other thing. <laughs> yeah so it, it you know now if you want a measure like a fair measure of mathematical skill that you can apply to everybody regardless of who they are, where they came from. And if you want it to try to figure out, do these kids really understand the math? You have to ask the question in a way that doesn't necessarily trigger those algorithms. Mm -hmm. Because if they, if, if, if all they're doing is deploying the algorithm, they're getting the answer whether they understand it or not. But we don't care about that. What we care about is, do they actually understand the math? And, you know, I want to be careful to say, when I say that this is what the tests are, the the, the, the test designers are trying to do, I don't mean to say that they're succeeding 100% or that this is the best way to do it or whatever, but um, it th they happen to be particularly, like, more effective to those ends than most of the ways, most of the other ways that we have applied on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, and so, so, you know, th those are a few things to sort of keep in mind to sort of be, you know, um, be, be fair, I guess, to the, to, you know, the big standardized tests. And the other thing I would say is, you know, to some extent, we almost don't have to care what the point of it is or, you know, how it's designed or, um, uh, you know, its value in the college admissions process, if, preparing for it cultivates transferable skills. So I can tell you, I mean, I can give you one thing that, that uh, was extremely impactful in my own life that, that, that I, um, that I learned from standardized tests, oddly enough, uh, multiple choice tests more, more broadly. Yeah. I mean, it, and, and this, you know, again, I'm not saying that this is like necessarily the best way to, to learn it or whatever, but you know, it happened, it happened to work for me. One thing I'm prone, hideously prone to is analysis paralysis. I uh, overthink the heck out of just about everything. And my I wife's over there that. nodding. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See? Me? <laughs> it, it like radiates out for me. Yeah. I mean, I just, it, I, and, and I, you know, I, I, I can't I have, I have trouble making decisions. Okay. Well, at some point I really had to internalize. If I have a multiple choice test, they're not actually asking me what the ideal answer is. They're asking me, if you had to pick from among these four or these five, which would you pick? The answer is there somewhere, <laughs> the right it's, one. <laughs> it's, it's there. 
first of all. So you can reverse engineer it if you want. That's mm-hmm. totally fair. And that's that's a skill set people really should be leaning into, frankly. Right. Um, but, you know, also just, you know, being able to put aside the quest for the ideal answer mm. and to, you know, apply reasonable criteria to get to the best or maybe the least crappy available option. Mm-hmm. I mean, when was the last time you made a big decision in your life that wasn't a multiple choice test, right? Right. And if you're constantly comparing all of your available options to the ideal, you're never going to be able to do anything. And how often in life are you choosing from three options that you hate? True. And there's nothing else available. (laughs) And you just have to pick the one that you hate the least. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) That is a skill that we need to be able to transfer into life for sure. And and you bring up a good point that we were going to get to this later. Tests Mm -hmm. are much less restrictive on how you got Yes. To the answer. So if kids realize, I mean, I'm kind of asking this as a question, if kids realize like, oh, I don't have to show all my work. The teacher's not going to see that. Like, I, I literally just need to get to the answer and I have more freedom over how I get there. Yeah. That could benefit them in other areas outside of this totally. test, right? That's, I mean, that, 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 that's one of the, that's one of the main ways, that's one of the main ways I use it. So, you know, we were talking previously, previously about encouraging problem solving skills, mm-hmm. um, you know, Often the best way to get through a complicated problem isn't, you know, what most people's instinct is, which is try to like read the whole thing and understand the whole thing and understand all the answer choices and then pick, you know, from the, no, the best way to do it is understand this piece of it. Okay. What conclusions can we draw? Write Mm -hmm. it down. Now let's understand this piece under, you know, uh, to the extent we can write it down. If, if there's like a complicated problem, Okay, I can't understand the thing in its in its in its entirety, but I can understand this piece of it. What does that mean? And you know, in 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 certain ways, you could sort of almost like back into the answer, or or like you know, chip away at the problem mm-hmm. in you know in in um like small steps. And uh, I use what one of the, one of the things I do with test prep is I use test questions as opportunities to encourage students to problem solve. Mm -hmm. So rather than teaching them the tips, the tips and tricks, right. You know, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll ask them, um, what do you, what are your thoughts about this? If this thing as a whole seems unintelligible, is there an aspect of it that seems intelligible to you? What can we do based on that? Okay. Are you overwhelmed? Let's just consider two of these answer choices at a time. Right. You know, and just little bits and pieces like that. Right. Uh, and I, I, you know, try to like try and get every possible opportunity to build on whatever their instincts are mm-hmm. um, and come up with a way that because because I think, you know, I can I can talk all day about what are the best approaches for me, but that's not necessarily relevant for any individual person. Sure. You sure. Know, the, so to the, the, the best parent way. who says, well, I think the score is meaningless or not a good, you know, my child's not a good test taker or whatever your point would be there's still value in the process of preparing for yes types of questions those types of tests because it's yes. more about the process than the product yeah even if we're going to skip the score scrap the score whatever sure. what what did they learn while they were preparing to evaluate those types of questions right. um that's what really counts nobody even cares about my sat score <laughs> I wasn't going to ask. I mean, <laughs> people, people don't, people don't. I, so I, I was, I was, um, I, uh, I got a 1400 when I was in high school. That was, that was what, 1999, 98. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, and I mean, that, that was with, that was with no prep. And then I took it again and I got a 1360. So, hey. <laughs> <Not great. laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, well, so not great as in, you know, moving in the wrong direction, but Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, Maybe overconfident but, but, second time. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. And, yeah. And it, but you know, nobody, nobody, um, n- nobody cares. Nobody asks me. It does. It doesn't. It does not matter. What matters is what you did to get the score, which in my case was very little. Right. And I paid for it in that sense because you know, getting a good score, uh, you know, reinforced in my head the notion that all I had to do to succeed was show up show up which we and talked about right in our we other did video. yeah boy yeah. did i pay for that later meanwhile the kid who starts at like a 950 and fights and claws and scratches up to a, like an 1150 or whatever 
and then throws the score in the bin because they don't feel like it's competitive at the colleges they're applying to. Who are you going to bet on in the long run? Definitely that kid. Right, right, right. That's an excellent point. Um, So while we're talking about test prep as a way to build useful skills, um, what other skills would you say kids are working on when you're helping them prepare for a test? <laughs> Uh, I'm okay. Sure so <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, 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 there are a bunch I could pick on, but uh, I want to, um, there, there's one I can uh, illustrate with a story that I think is particularly salient. So I had two students recently, uh, uh, who were preparing for the ACT, two of my ACT students recently. One of them, uh, was consistently getting like 97th, 98th percentile scores in okay. practice he was shooting for 36 and that was actually a plausible relatively plausible um thing to shoot for for him so our work was about figuring out every single possible little edge case that he could possibly encounter and making sure that he could handle literally anything that came his way mm -hmm. at the same time i had another student who would have been lucky to get a 22 mm -hmm. 23 he had started. I'm not familiar with the structure for the ACT. Oh, yeah. So a perfect score is a 36. Okay. Which nobody gets. Right. Like, I mean, it's it, it practically makes. Maybe this kid. Better. I can't wait to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well. Uh, I mean, it's so okay. Short digression. One one thing uh, people should understand about test scores is that they're not like grades in school. Like a grade in school is structured such that like, if you tick all the boxes in the class, you get an A. Right. Well, if someone else, if one of your classmates just ticked all the boxes and you absolutely crushed it, you're both going to get the same A+. Because grades at school are not designed to differentiate among top performers. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there are reasons for that. You know, right. it's not a good a good thing or bad thing. It's just, it's just, that's just the way they, they do it. Right. Um, and, you know, a lot of people think it's due to grade inflation and everything, which, okay, fair enough. But anyway, <laughs> that that's, that, that's the way it ends up being. Yeah. On a test score, you do like with, with standardized tests, they do want to differentiate among top performers. So the idea is most people get somewhere in the middle right. of the range from somewhere near a zero to 36 in the case of the, of an ACT. Um, but like, if you're in the thirties at all, like that's already stratospheric. Okay. That yeah, helps. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but so yeah, so there was a one student who was like predictably um, aiming for a, he was aiming for a 36. Uh, he, he ended up getting it by the way. Oh, wow. And, um, but you know, the, the other student, uh, he would have been lucky to get a score in like the, the, uh, you know, the mid twenties, um, and, you know, particularly in math and, um, but, but the thing is he started in like the mid teens right? and he, he, he was, he was making progress there, but anyway, so There's just to pick math, to be made, though. true, true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. But, you know, in, in, with, in math in particular, okay, you know, I, I was telling him, I was like, look, okay, 60 minutes, 60 questions. That's a fast pace. But remember, it's specifically designed so that almost nobody is going to be able to answer every single question correctly in the time you have. Crucially, you don't need to answer more than 30 of them correctly to improve mm -hmm. on your previous score. That's the way it's designed. Right. So go in Which there. Just knowing that. I would think knowing would that leg up. <laughs> exactly just just you're going to go in there and you're going to do a really good job on 30 of the questions all right and and doing a good job means you're handling yourself well it doesn't necessarily mean you know getting the right answer but i mean that's right. another topic and you know on a good day maybe you'll get 40 of them and you're just going to guess blindly on the rest and and that's that's the way to you know best exploit the opportunity so I was reflecting on this afterwards uh, with Boneka, my wife, and, and and I thought to myself, you know, of those two students, for whom was the SAT more reflective of the rest of his life? Mm. Definitely the second kid. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many things we could be doing, we should be doing as adults. And if we get half of them done, man, that's a good day. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. And that kiddo was learning stress management, right, decision exactly. making. You talked about analysis paralysis. You couldn't, if you're on a clock and you got four choices, you right. got to make a decision, right? But you're making a decision under pressure, which yeah. is an even harder version of decision making. Absolutely. 
Yeah. yeah. And then, and that's, I mean, it's a, it's a great lab laboratory basically for like figuring out quirks of your own psychology and how best to exploit them in a, uh, you know, in a moderate stress right. level situation. Well, and pacing is, is what I, you know, what yes. you're talking about of like, yep. okay, there's this many questions. We get this much time. You actually only need to focus on these that way that child knows, you know, you can't spend however many minutes on question one, because you need to get right. to the next. 29, yeah. which and, and some and, of us and, would probably do. <laughs> no, I, I mean, a lot of us. And, and you know, um, it, it's one of, one of the things I, I, I most enjoy is, is helping students, you know, when I can, helping them understand, like, you know, this, you know, if you can't do this question, move on, right? Like that right. strategy isn't a thing you should adopt because you can't whatever, whatever, whatever. It's you're making a reasonable decision about how to allocate your efforts. Right. Yeah. Very, very valuable. You know? All right. So we have a lot of good reasons why these tests are maybe not meaningless uh, and are meaningful or are great opportunities for developing useful skills. Right. Exactly. So this test optional uh, thing that you mentioned, which we're mm -hmm. not in the college arena yet, so I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds like what you're saying is that sometimes you now don't have to take that's right. These tests as part of your college admissions. Um, so does optional mean that they won't help you or what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and um, I, you know, the, the, um, the, the sort of fortunate and unfortunate thing about test optional policies is that um, they really vary mm. from school to school and like, uh, you know, there are cases in which test optional, it just hides the reality that they do place a lot of emphasis on test scores and or like, I mean, at, at, at some institutions, they, they will apparently estimate what, like, if you don't submit test scores, they'll estimate what they think your test score might have been mm. and then use that as part of the formula. And then, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, there are schools that really are like yeah if you want to send them that's fine if you don't want to send them that's totally cool you know just whatever. Right. and it, it really it depends on the values of the institution what kinds of people they're looking for uh and what they have seen with respect to um what information they need from an applicant to enable them to make a good decision about whether that person's going to be a good fit at that school so that's one reason it's going to vary from Yes, what it means for absolutely. place to place and what the value they right. put on it. So right. you, and you said earlier, you think that those admission policies are ambiguous on purpose. Yeah. What do you yeah. mean? By, like, what's the what's the intent behind that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I I don't want to make it sound too sinister. Sure. Um, but because like, but okay. The 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 most recent wave of uh, test optional admissions policies came during COVID because. Mm -hmm test dates were getting canceled left, right, and center for obvious reasons. And uh, it's, colleges were like, well, you know, we can't reasonably right. expect people to have SAT or ACT scores to submit. Well, one of the things that they noticed was that they were just deluged by applications. They're just buried in applications. And that did a few things for them. One thing was that it gave them a ton more flexibility mm. to uh, admit the kinds of students they would have liked to see, but who had been self-excluding because they thought their test scores weren't weren't good enough. And and this is, you know, this is another, you know, important bit of context. Um, if you uh, you know, have a sort of a privileged life and then you go to like a, a high-end private school and you get a 1200 on the SAT, um, you know, that's one thing. Whereas if you grew up poor at it and went to an under-resourced uh, went to under-resourced schools all your life and got a 1200 that means something completely different sure you know but there are a lot of there are a lot of kids who who might have fallen into the latter category or, or something similar but been like yeah well you know I, I, 1200 isn't enough so they would have yeah but sure. and the, the, the admissions committees want to see those kids right <laughs> you know right so they, they they don't want to have it out there that they need test scores because in a lot of cases they don't right. so it just gives them a ton more flexibility to craft the class they want okay and at the same time, <laughs> it drives their acceptance numbers through the floor, the percentages rather. Mm -hmm. It makes them look way more selective. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, which makes them look better on paper. 
Um, and, <laughs> and because people applying to those schools are applying test optional, like, like one of the common bits of advice is if your score isn't in the top 50% of like test scores for that school, don't submit your test score. Mm. Well, what do you think that does to the averages? Right. So then they get to say our average SAT score is like a 1500 or whatever. And you're like, what really? Like, that makes a lot of sense. But, yeah. so, so it's a little sinister. <laughs> it's not a lot sinister, but a little. I mean, I I want to I want to uh, and, and, and uh, you know I, I want to emphasize like it's not like anybody's sitting in a in a in a room like right. twirling wow. a mustache being like ah <laughs> yes it's just you know if you want to know how people in an organization are going to behave yeah. you don't you can't look at the quality of the people or the policies or whatever you have to look at the incentive structure right 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 so, okay so if a parent and student are considering a school that has a test optional policy what what should they do with that information yeah well okay I mean um I. Uh, so, you know, uh, as usual, I'm going to caveat this a little bit. Um, uh, I, I would love to have an admissions counselor in the room uh, <laughs> at, 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 you know, in answering that question. What I can tell you from, from my perspective is remember that if a student's test scores are like, if, if they seem like they're not good enough for, you know, by whatever measure, you know, or if it feels like they're a bad test taker or something, mm -hmm. that's telling you something. So, you know, and and there's always something valuable in there. It might not be what you think it is, but there's always something valuable in there. So I would encourage trying to get to the bottom of that. And, I, you know, I have conversations with people all the time uh, along these lines. You know, let's let's try to figure out what this is really telling us. And, and then that knowledge can inform whether we make a decision to pursue test prep. Right. So like in my son's case, I could look at this and say, well, the, the root issue is tests in general make him anxious mm -hmm. so we can deal with that. Right. Multi-step problems, multiple choice answers. He gets overwhelmed. Like you talked about analysis paralysis, mm -hmm. making decisions under pressure. So I could say, we don't care if he's going to college. We don't care what his score is going to be, but wow, the value in helping him with those things. And then maybe if it becomes a reasonable option after that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and again, like just, just to be clear, I'm not saying every anxious or test averse kid should go through test prep just for that reason alone. Like right. I, 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 but what I would suggest is that should be one input into the, into the, into the greater calculus. I mean, it's, it's sort of like, well, you know, what are we going to like, if, if, if the choice is, um, you know, let's try to, you know, let's try some test prep and you know maybe we can get something out of this process and in along the way we might get a score that's worth submitting for you know for admissions purposes or for um merit aid scholarships and so on right gotcha, gotcha. versus let's just not even try well uh, that's where i think the you know the, the the larger value of test prep done right should be one of the inputs into the decision making okay, process got it. Does that, does that so, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So let's say a parent's watching this and they're like, oh, we weren't going to think about this, but maybe now, maybe now we need to, when should we be thinking? Like, yeah. What's too early? Is it ever too late? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So uh, I, I, I can tell you what's, what's too late and what's too late usually, I mean, it, as I'm saying this, of course, I'm, I'm coming up with exceptions, but um, 99 times out of a hundred, um, two or three weeks before the test is far too late like and, and and it's it's interesting because what we're used to i mean schools generally train us to think that two or three weeks in advance of a test is quite a long time right because tests in schools lend themselves really really well to cramming um you know for, even after so long in the business I, I i still am blown away by how insanely resistant the sat and act are to cramming they just don't respond to it like it's it's amazing. Plus, if the issue is pressure, stress, anxiety, like right. all that, cramming is probably not going to be conducive right. to evening that right. all out. Yeah, like you know, so and and you know, starting prep two or three weeks before a test date could give us valuable information that we can use. So, so sorry, it can give it can give a student valuable strategies mm -hmm. to try in that realistic setting, knowing that the real prize is going to be a later test date. Got right. It. Okay. But, it, you know, if, if, if this is definitely, you know, if, uh, 
you know, we're definitely going for like the June test or whatever, and it's halfway through May. And now we're starting to think about it. Eh, you know, let's give it a shot, but that's so better to go more. better to go a little further out than to much to better to err on the side of starting earlier. Yeah. Okay. Now, Even like and, six months. Is that? Like oh yeah, crazy? for sure. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I always say as early as your child's schedule and temperament will allow, but no earlier than that. Okay. okay. And what do you so, mean by as early as their temperament will allow? Like a yeah. slow to warm kid needs further to start further out. So I, I, I think, um, I, yes, uh, potentially. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the main example that comes to my mind is um, how are they going to feel when they haven't even seen in math class half the concepts they're going to encounter mm -hmm. on the math section? Right. Can they repeatedly see those questions and say, okay, I'm not measuring myself against my ability to do those questions yet. It's fine. We'll get there. Hmm. Now I have to, you know, compartmentalize and because I'm working on this aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I'd say it's a rare person. I mean, it's not just, let's not just talk about kids, right? It's a rare person who can compartmentalize that effectively for like a year or more. Right. Right. You know, right. usually what happens is if, you know, if you keep butting up against those things, it starts to provoke a little bit of anxiety. Right. But so there's really no exact answer. It's more case by right. case. Right. Your child, that's, their schedule. That's the idea. Okay. Yeah. And then what about, so let's say a family wants to go now look for some test prep and the time is right or soon. Is individual better than like a group, boot camp? Where do you fall in that? What's your opinion? I guess we'd be calling it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Probably with a caveat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I, yeah, there's so many caveats on what I say. Okay, yeah. I know, I so, know you by now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have the worst kind of opinions. That is to say, extremely nuanced and complicated. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, now it, the the question always is, you know, what um, what kind of person is the student? All right, so if they're highly motivated, if they're very independent, if they're conscientious, and if they have no unique learning needs. Mm -hmm. then they can get a lot of bang for the buck out of a boot camp or a class. Okay. Yeah. Um, otherwise, or if they try that and it doesn't work, then you want to go one-on-one. One-on-one, -on -one, just to be clear, one-on-one uh, -on -one with a properly matched tutor mm. is always going to beat a boot camp or a class. You know, the question is, you know, is it is it worth the the time and the extra expense right. that that has to be okay. made on a case by case basis right mm -hmm. um but you know again if somebody's motivated independent conscientious that you know um they'll still benefit more from one on one tutoring but they can get more bang for the buck potentially out of a out of a class you know otherwise you know it's best to go one to one mm -hmm. and within that there is there's a spectrum uh in in my opinion of of, of you know how rigid and structured are the tutor's methods. Mm. So on one end of the spectrum, uh, you'll have tutors who say, all right, it's going to be this many classes and each one is, you know, this many, uh, you know, like this many hours, like one hour, two hours or whatever. On this day, we'll do this. On this day, we'll do that. And, and they, they know in advance, like what they're going to take the kid through. Right. Um, and that's good for, that can be good for somebody who needs the structure and has the wherewithal to follow it. On the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, you have tutors who are sort of like more responsive on a day-to-day -day basis, more flexible, uh, and those can be good for students who always need to know the why, uh, if they're somehow intimidated by the process and they need like more of a close relationship with, you know, with their tutor, um, if they struggle with non-academic aspects, so like stress, anxiety, mm -hmm. learning differences, and so on, or if they just learn so quickly that a rigid program would hold them back, I was talking about my student who got a 36 on the ACT. That was a great example of the, you know, the flexibility that I try to employ. We started out doing two hour sessions, mm -hmm. but it became clear very quickly. I was just like, dude, I'll work with you until the cows come home, but it looks like you got this. Let's drop back. And very right. soon we were meeting half an hour a week and he achieved his goals. Right. Um, so parents where the would want to look at mind. multiple Yes. Style. Multiple tutors that hopefully also have different styles to try to get Absolutely. the right fit, which sounds like now I'm going to reach out to you about a separate 
video? What should we be asking these tutors before we, before yeah. we commit to working with them? So we'll do that on another that sounds day. sounds great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Always have an in-depth conversation and, and um, yeah. yeah, like vet, like interview every single one. Right, right. Yeah, because it is As so much permits. about fit. It's got to be about the fit. Learning style, the fit, the vibe, all of yep. that. Awesome. Well, I... I did not know much about standardized testing before this. This has been super <laughs> helpful for me. So I imagine it. it'll be really helpful for parents. Cool. Um, lastly, tell us where families can find you if they want to seek you out. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Justin Menda. Uh, my wife is Boneka Islam. Our company is Rocket Prep. Uh, we're online at rocket-prep.com. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a contact form right there on the website. Let's uh, awesome. Let's have a conversation. Great. Well, I love having conversations with you. We'll definitely do this again. Likewise, and thank you so much for your time today. You got Bye, it. Thank everybody. you.